Thank you, and uh, it's great to be here um, at Lincoln. Uh, we're going to slightly change the emphasis about uh, what we're talking about. This is probably going to be the least scientific presentation of the day. Um, but what I want us to think about now is not so much what happens on farm, but what happens at the end or other end of the scale on plate. Uh, I work for Beef and Lamb New Zealand Inc., which is the small part of Beef and Lamb based in Auckland. Uh, but before you hold that against me, I live in central Otago. So um, I've had uh, a lovely weekend make, making my way up from Cromwell. So, uh, yep, I do not live uh, uh, north of the Bombay Hills. And as you can probably tell, I don't come from north of the Bombay Hills originally either. Uh, it's a real pleasure to have come to New Zealand almost 12 years ago to the day. It was the 9th of June 2001 that I arrived in New Zealand thinking I was going to be here for a year. I'm sure many other Brits, possibly some people here today, um, have a similar story to tell. But I was asked to come out and do this job because I'd been a nutritionist with Meat and Livestock Commission in the UK. And so I was asked to come and take the role of nutrition manager here for a year to cover a maternity leave. And I'm pleased to say my predecessor didn't come back. So uh, I've stayed, possibly too long it sometimes feels, but uh, still, still loving it at the, at the moment. And in a way, that's partly because of the work that we do and the fantastic product that you all produce that we're then able to promote. And it really is not difficult um, to feel very passionate about such a wonderful product. So thank you uh, for producing something that we have a real pleasure in promoting. You partly fund us, as you know, uh, and we also gain some funding from the meat companies and the meat retailers. So that's our part in Auckland. But um, what I'm going to talk to you about today is the story and evolution of our promotional work and, and what we base it upon. Um, and then we'll be talking to Sophie at the end, who is, of course, one of today's faces of beef and lamb. But we have huge expectations of food. Uh, now, I want you to realize that you are not typical beef and lamb consumers. And I really can't stress that enough. You are not an everyday beef and lamb shopper. You may eat beef and lamb every day, that wouldn't surprise me. Um, but can, the consumers we're dealing with are very different people um, to most of us. But we probably all expect this of the food that we do eat. Um, we expect it to be good value for money. We want it to be good quality. Most of us in a country like New Zealand take it for granted that our food is safe. Um, most consumers nowadays, those who are lucky enough to have a nine to five job, do not know what they're going to be eating for tea when they leave the office at five o'clock. So we are expecting food to be fast. Um, so we want it to be convenient. We also want it to be good for us. We want it to be environmentally friendly, whatever that means. Uh, and to every consumer, it means something different. And above all, we want it to taste good. So we have quite high expectations. But we're not alone in New Zealand. These are what we call in marketing jargon um, the demand driver, drivers, and they are globally recognized. So still most consumers around the world will be um, buying their food based on these key drivers. And I'm pleased to say from my point of view as a qualified dietitian and nutritionist that health and nutrition still ranks up there with consumers. And I'll talk a little bit later about um, the evolution of the Iron Maidens campaign and the, whether or not health and nutrition is still up there. But um, yes, globally, it's still seen as a key demand driver. So I'll just take you back a little bit. Um, Beef and Lamb New Zealand, or the marketing bureau as we used to be called, has always focused very much nutritionally on iron, historically. We really feel that we own that ground in terms of marketing and promotion. And why do we pick on iron? Well. Unfortunately, despite this being um, a developed country, we still see nutritional deficiencies within our population, which, frankly, considering when we walk into the supermarket, there's up to 30,000 different products available to us. It's ridiculous that we still don't get the nutrition we need. And we do still see levels of iron deficiency and anemia, particularly amongst our infants and our toddlers. Um, infants, because they require so much iron, and a six-month-old baby requires as much iron as, as most of you men, adult men do. The problem for toddlers is they come off their fortified milks or breast milk, they start getting fussy about food, 
and that iron intake plummets. So they are, if anything, more at risk than babies. Unfortunately, us poor women need over double the amount of iron every day than you guys do. It's you know, just one of, those, one of the many things that, that we have to suffer uh, is, is needing. <laughs> yeah, go on, sympathy. <laughs> and particularly today, I need that sympathy. Um, and so we tend to have a lower iron intake than the recommended because our, our needs are so high. We're very needy. Uh, but most cases can be prevented by diet. So if we're eating a nutritious, balanced diet, then we should be able to get all that we need. And of course, beef and lamb, the thing that we are able to promote is that we produce two of the most iron-rich sources of food within our diet. And it's because it's the type of iron that's in beef and lamb that's so important. We produce what's called heme iron in our beef and lamb. Many of you will remember this uh, if you're old enough. Um, the old ad showing spinach and meat comparison. Now, we did a similar thing to this in the UK. They've used this analogy in Australia because it's just so um, easy to portray, this huge pile of spinach that you have to eat to get the same amount of iron as you do from your little bit of steak. So we still produce this poster for midwives and other health professionals to get that message across that um, you, know, you get that much iron in your meat. But probably about 10 years ago now, we started expanding that nutrition message. And these are really all the nutrients, the beef and lamb, that we could be promoting. Um, so we've got zinc alongside iron as a mineral. We've got B12 that you only get in foods of animal origin. There isn't much fat if it's lean, which is still a, a positive in terms of consumers. It's high quality protein. Meaty fish oils are the omega-3s, which um, many of you will know we have higher levels of omega-3s in our beef and lamb because it's been raised on pasture rather than grain. And the new kid on the block is vitamin D. Now, probably, well, possibly not in England for me, but many of you as kids will have been allowed to run around naked in the summer and on the beach, and nobody cared about sunblock. Uh, well, nowadays, obviously, we're very conscious of cancer prevention, and we have our kids in togs up to here. We smother them in sunblock. They have to take a hat to school before they can go out to play. And that we are beginning to see vitamin D insufficiency in some of our kids, particularly um, in the southeast part of New Zealand, which you'll guess where that is, not in sunny central. Um, and so, you know, the, the dietary sources of vitamin D are becoming more important. And we now know that the vitamin D in meat is, has a higher potency, for want of a better word, in a similar way to the, the type of iron. So there's a lot to say about beef and lamb. That's about the end of the technical bit. Um, and for every message that we give about beef and lamb, like beef rich in iron, um, lamb high in protein, I need the base of that iceberg in terms of scientific information to be able to back up what we're saying. And because we do ensure that all our messages are underpinned by sound science, that's why we enjoy the credibility that we do within the scientific community here in New Zealand. So the tip of the iceberg is our message. The base of the iceberg is all the science and information that we need to be able to back that up. But consumers aren't interested in milligrams and millimoles and nutrients. Those are all words that would turn them off completely. So you do need to package all these, this information into a good story. And as long as your, your message is based on sound science, you've got to have the good story. And this is a, a very good example of a very bad way of doing it. This is a, a billboard campaign that we ran in the UK that failed miserably. Um, and it's years old now, so um, I can use it quite happily. Now, in the UK, you tend to talk about meat and two veg. I know in New Zealand, we, we talk about meat and three veg. So just um, pretend this says two, uh, three veg at the, at the bottom. And what it's trying to get at, which I'm sure you'll all understand, is it's trying to say that meat has vitamins, iron, protein, minerals, blah, 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 in it, because, and then you have your, your veg with it. But it was simply too complicated for consumers to understand, even with the byline in the top right-hand corner that explained a bit about that. When you have a billboard, you need consumers to be able to take the message instantly. You know when you drive past billboards yourself that you've seen, you need to be able to get that message straight away. 
So a very good example of how not to do it. So we made it very, very, very simple. And therefore, we bought a campaign from the Australians because they did it beautifully simply, as you might imagine. And um, I know we like to think we're terribly different from Australians, but in terms of marketing campaigns, roughly what works there will work here. And they have an awful lot more money than us, so we, t in the past, have tended to buy campaigns from them for about 10% of the cost, that it, the cost of making them. So we brought over the Dancing Butchers. Now, this is also a very good example of something that wouldn't necessarily work all around the world because we bought this campaign in about 2003, and you, you may remember it was these butchers dancing down the streets, bashing their saucepans, going, you know, beef is great and lamb is rich in protein or whatever. And I took one look at that as a r relatively new immigrant, having lived through BSE in the UK, and said, well, that just proves it. Beef sends you mad. <laughs> so, anyway, we ran with it because we're not in England. Uh, we're in New Zealand, and we got great cut through with this ad. Now, you could say the controversy that it uh, brought was the reason that a lot of people knew the ad. But in some respects, no publicity was bad publicity where this ad went. So. Very, very simple, red meat feel good. That's all it was. It was nothing about milligrams of iron and minimals of whatever else. So, and it had a sort of double meaning. It was red meat can make you feel good, but also feel good about eating red meat because a large part of my job is still overcoming issues about red meat. You know, whether it causes curly hair, ingrown toenails, cancer, heart disease, whatever. Every week I am dealing virtually, unfortunately, with something in the media about what meat or does or doesn't do. So this campaign was also trying to help people feel good about eating red meat. You wonder if I'm ever going to get to the Iron Maidens. Well, yes, I am. Because a year later, in Athens, these three amazing women all became gold medalists. <clears throat> and it gave us, with Caroline and Georgina looking vaguely similar, it gave us the wonderful play on words to take that red meat feel good campaign into beef plus lamb feel twice as good and um, we were already supporting the girls in a in a low way but we had never used them as our faces of beef and lamb and it was really after those Athens Olympics that we decided to do that and heck they don't look bad on a billboard do they <laughs> I mean that looks a much better billboard than our piece of meat with a few vegetables that we used in the UK so um, that was how the Iron Maidens were born for, um, after those Athens Olympics. And we could never have really expected how quickly and how well that campaign um, got the cut through we needed with consumers. Now, before you ask me, because I know you will, why do we always use female athletes? It's simply because young women are our key target market. So of all the people who um, aren't going to eat red meat, which fortunately in New Zealand there aren't that many, um, those who don't eat red meat are most likely to be young women. And of course, not only are they, um, you know, I know there are lots of new age men in this room, but they are still the primary shopper. So they're today and tomorrow's primary shoppers, they're today and tomorrow's mothers, and they are the people least likely to be eating red meat as, young, as youngsters. So by showing successful, attractive young women that we all wish we had been when we'd been that age, um, eating red meat, if it's good for them, it's good for us in terms of young women of New Zealand. If you show men eating red meat, so even if you showed, you know, whoever the big men these days are um, in, in the young person's world, it just reinforces meat as a man's food. So it's not that they'll, you know, watch Dan Carter, who's probably yesterday's gorgeous man, but he's still quite gorgeous as far as I'm concerned. If you show Dan Carter eating a steak, well, that's great, but that's because he's a bloke and he's got, to, you know, he's a rugby player. That would not give us the cut through that we want it to. So we use um, successful young women and we feel they've given us a very fashionable, credible image. Now, obviously, um, these girls have all retired now. Oh, now this, this, these surveys make me laugh. But the fact that they're ridiculous 
is, doesn't matter because Caroline and Georgie considered the second most trusted people in New Zealand in 2009. How many New Zealanders have met them? You know, really, they're cr it's a crazy survey, but it's telling us, it's giving us a really positive message. Um, Sarah, the most trusted in 2007. Well, that's great as far as we're concerned, um, even if it's a pretty potty survey. But of course, they have all retired now. Um, Sarah had retired before the Beijing Olympics. Caroline and Georgie retired absolutely as they got out of the boat in Beijing, and they have not sat in a boat since that day. Um, they were <laughs> finished over it. But thank goodness they got that second gold medal, which was all we needed <laughs> to continue their credibility. And they are still supporting us. So um, they are both mothers now. Uh, Cromwell seems to be a little bit of a enclave for the older beef and lamb girls because uh, Caroline and Georgina, as well as me, all live now in Cromwell. So uh, we have a little um, beef and lamb <laughs> car park in Cromwell because we still give these girls uh, vehicles um, because they are at the end of the day moving billboards for us and that's how we view it. And the cost of the payback we get back for providing those vehicles we, still is, we feel is still value for money. So um, they've both got two children now and because a lot of our work with health professionals is focused on that baby toddler age, it's just perfect that we've got two of, well, Sarah Ulmer has had children as well, but Caroline and Georgina are happy for us to use imagery of their kids and quotes um, in our advertising. So you won't probably be able to read that because it's a bit blurred. But basically the quotes talk about when, you know, we needed iron when we were rowing and we now know that our kids do too. So it's a great endorsement. But because um, after Beijing, we knew that we needed to bring some younger blood into the stable um, with the three slightly older girls retiring. And we were very fortunate that Sarah Walker's manager happened to be this, or agent happened to be the same agent as Sarah Ulmer's. And he approached us and said, would we consider working with Sarah Walker? So uh, perfect from our point of view, because she's a lot younger. How old is Sarah, about 23? 23? 22. Um, and <laughs> she rides this ridiculous looking bike with an old bag like me. I look at her BMX bike wheels and think, why would you bother? But you know, BMX biking is huge amongst young people, and I'm sure many of you will have kids or possibly grandkids or nieces or nephews or whoever that BMX bike, they love it. And certainly when we made the ad in the top right-hand corner, which was the first ad to introduce Sarah, um, the, the ad was about the other three growing up um, on beef and lamb, and Sarah scoots in at the end on her bike. And that last shot was at a primary school in Auckland somewhere and it was Sarah that the kids all wanted to speak to you know they I mean the others were are still popular but Sarah really resonates with the youngsters which was great from our point of view she was a world champion almost the first time she sat on her bike um, she's obviously medaled at the last two Olympics gaining a silver medal last year in London so she became a really good new face for us younger face and gelled really well with with the other three but we got to the stage last year where we were thinking, can we continue with the Iron Maidens? You know, there are all these advertising campaigns have a finite life. And the worst thing you can do is take a campaign lo longer than you should. Um, and so we actually had started working on some creative moving away from the Iron Maidens. Sophie probably doesn't know this. Um, and we were going still with some nutritional basis because we did some focus group work and nutrition was still coming out loud and clear as being important. But we also suffer from this problem that people think beef and lamb is harder to cook than the other proteins. I can't even bring myself to say the words. Um, but so we, we have to try and help people understand how to cook different um, cuts of beef and lamb. So we had this, this concept sort of begun and created. We hadn't shot anything, um, but we'd had it signed off at board level. We were going with our new idea. And suddenly, bang, this girl from nowhere comes and strikes gold in London. 
And I mean, how many people here actually had heard of Lisa Carrington before London 212? I mean, I know she's a North Islander, but um, yeah, very few of us. And the first interview Lisa gave um, after winning her gold medal, the interviewer said to her, so you've won gold, that must mean you're becoming a beef and lamb girl. <laughs> and we went, oh, right, well, maybe she should. Um, and so, you know, it made us completely rethink our campaign. We had Sarah Walker, who'd already um, been working with the others. We were supporting Sophie at a, at a low level prior to the London Olympics. Sophie obviously went and whoosh, wiped the board. Uh, three golds, three silvers, amazing achievement. Um, and then here was Lisa, who was already assumed to be becoming a beef and lamb girl, even though we'd never even spoken to her in our lives. So got in touch with um, Lisa's um, agent, and yes, she would love to be part of the team. Asked Sophie if she wouldn't mind stepping up, um, because you know the three girls now give us a great new team of young, fresh, beautiful, stunning, billboard um, girls of Iron Maidens replacing the girls that we've had before. So that's where we are today. We have, as I say, continued with the Iron Maidens campaign because it was an absolute, I hate the term, but it was a no-brainer last year when that happened and everybody just assumed gold medal means beef and lamb. What stronger endorsement can you have? Um, it was also true, it happened in Beijing as well. Um, I don't know if you, any of you remember, during the Olympics, there's an embargoed period when we can do nothing relating to our relationship with Olympic athletes. And it's about ooh, six or eight weeks around the Olympics when we can't mention the word Olympic or gold or um, anything like that um, and, and, and our association with those athletes. And yet in Beijing, when Caroline and Georgie, okay, the final was probably a little closer than any of us had wished, including them, when they absolutely walked their semi-final and left the others for dead, Peter Williams in his commentary said, so if you need any more inf and anything else to show you what beef and lamb does to you, there you go. Well, we could never have even paid for that. So there is that huge strength of endorsement. Um, but as I say, we, had, we were beginning to feel that that campaign might be losing traction. We were totally wrong. And we turned a U-turn, and we now have these three wonderful girls supporting us now. So it's a great pleasure that um, this morning Sophie's come to join us. Sophie is a, a local girl, very, very local, having been at Lincoln High. Is that right? So please um, welcome our beef and lamb iron maiden and gold medalist, Sophie Pascoe. Now, are you wired? Have you I got think a microphone so. in yeah. there? Okay, good. What I thought we'd do with, um, <laughs> do with, what I thought I would ask Sophie to do is um, share some thoughts around both her work as an athlete, oh, but also her work with pose. us. So again? Doing the same pose. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> you should start. Yeah. I have to say, the one thing that um, we noticed, we've noticed with Sophie and Sarah and Lisa compared to Sarah, Georgie and Caroline, is how natural these girls are and how well they work together. Um, I mean, you do, you all know each other, don't you? Yeah, yeah. Um, we're and like sisters, really. So it's quite cool that the relationship kind of just started as soon as we met, yeah. It was great. Because what we did this year, I don't know if you remember with our ads with the other girls, at the end when Caroline and Georgie are doing the red meat boogie, which I won't do because I don't dance, um, Sarah Ulmer is stood there with a megaphone and she's directing them. And that had to be done because she wouldn't dance. She's actually, you know, she was very reserved about doing that. Um, whereas these three, well, you probably wouldn't stop them if you asked them to do the red meat boogie. Um, and what we also did this year with, with the latest ad or the end of last year, whenever it was, for the first time we did ads unscripted. Now, usually as nutrition manager, I sign off the scripts. To, so I know that every word that's going to come out of their mouths is nutritionally accurate and scientifically robust. Whereas this time, because it was unscripted, I had to go and sit and listen to them all day and make sure every word that came out of, <laughs> of their mouths was, was okay and watch them eat this huge number of beef and lamb meals. 
I don't know if you remember when, when we were driving home from oh, yeah. the ad, I took Sophie to the airport. I was sick. And <laughs> Sophie felt really car sick. She was so full of beef and lamb. And there was me, absolutely ravenous, having not had anything. But tell us a bit about since becoming a beef and lamb Iron Maid and the re reaction of friends or family, members of the public. I think my biggest reaction I get out on the streets probably, I'm just the plus. Uh, which has uh, come across quite well and obviously that's my go-to quote on the street for the little kids which is quite, you know, it's great to be known as a beef and lamb ambassador especially out here back in Lincoln. Uh, obviously having the beef and lamb truck I get a lot of uh, mentions and I was actually just saying <laughs> before the fee I was parked outside of school and the kids thought I was a promo chick with some beef and lamb in the car so <laughs> that was a little bit awkward when I said no but yeah, I've definitely had a lot of reaction, more of the younger viewers and the um, kids at school, which I think is really beneficial for them. Mm. Mm. And that's certainly something we noticed. Um, Sophie and Sarah came to the Wanaka show this year. I'm sure some of you might have, have been there as well. Um, and the number of young girls that came into the marquee when we were having some downtime, Sophie and Sarah just kept giving. It was amazing. Um, but it was all young girls, wasn't it? Coming yeah. in, wanting to meet them, wanting posters signed, just wanting to chat. Um, so, and, and were there, was there any reaction from them or? Yeah, there's always reaction from the young girls. You know, they, they're the ones that we obviously inspire. And uh, obviously being girls, I remember being at that age that I would look up to the likes of Sarah and the twins because I had a low de uh, iron deficiency when I was swimming. So I had to get iron jabs and my buttocks, which is not exactly the nicest thing to have. So to be able to promote that to the young girls, which is that really, that 13 to sort of 16 age bracket, mm. um, is really great. And knowing that we can do that together as girls is great. Great, yeah. I know um, Sarah Walker as well has had iron deficiency problems in the past, and Caroline, I think. Um, I don't know if any of you listened to the conference call that I did with Caroline and Georgie talking about some of these issues and, and Caroline had said, you know, her GP had told her to go and eat half a cow. Um, and it was great once she started working with beef and lamb that she could actually afford to do that. Yeah. <laughs> so um, hopefully <laughs> that's, that's given her some support. And, and I guess that leads us on to um, the support that we do give the girls and hopefully there are some benefits. Maybe you can yeah, absolutely. expand on that. Um, yeah, obviously the benefit is obviously our three girls uh, being so close together, but yeah, uh, our freezer's never empty at home, so uh, we definitely have the benefits of being able to uh, supply our household and our family with uh, red meat and obviously the monetary side of things and obviously the promotion with the vehicle. So for me it's been a huge uh, step up and uh, very beneficial as an athlete to have Beef and Lamb supporting us. You know, Beef and Lamb's my biggest sponsor on board with me, so Obviously, they do a lot for work for me, but that obviously comes from you guys as well. So mm. being able to promote the best lamb and beef in New Zealand uh, around the world is just like the best thing you can have, especially when we go away. The meat's not that great, to be honest. Uh, you know, we've, we've got set feeds uh, when we go away, but the best thing about coming back home is obviously having a steak or a roast, uh, and that's with our New Zealand meat. So. Mm. That's um, before Sophie became an Iron Maiden, I, I think that was probably about the, the only thing we were doing for her was yeah. actually paying for her beef and lamb. So um, what we tend to do is, is rig up with the local supermarket or whoever you buy your beef and lamb from. Um, if you were in Tapo, you might be buying it direct from Mike, who knows? Um, and just so that when they go to the supermarket and buy their food, the, the beef and lamb bill comes to us directly. Yeah. Now you know, to, to a, a lot of people that might not seem very much in terms of sponsorship when they think we're paying them millions of dollars. But actually to athletes, the, the protein part of their food bill is going to be the biggest part. So even if it's only 50 bucks a week, it's I still I think Rod's a bit shocked part. at what I order. But right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I do like the finer cuts and when you've got the benefits of <laughs> being a lamb being on board, you, get, you take it. But uh, yeah, well, no, I'm, it's I'm sure we would all say you deserve every dollar of it. So if it's but that's also get another you thing, you know, we've created a relationship with uh, particularly my retailer, which is the Mad Butcher in Sydenham, and they've been so supportive as well with you guys, and they know exactly what cuts I want every month, and they'll obviously, um, you know, 
p do perfection cuts for me and uh, I just come on in and uh, th that relationship's there and it's always giving. So great, it's great, great. Okay. Now, I'm sure you want to know a little bit about Sophie's life as an athlete as well, not just as an Iron Maiden, because you know, whilst we might think the Iron Maiden part's the most important part of her life, um, I guess what she does in the pool every now and again, every day, <laughs> is also quite important. So um, thinking about your swimming, what, sort of, um, what are the key principles or values you've learned while you're competing? Uh, I would say obviously the biggest three would be motivation, dedication and courage. Uh, those are obviously huge for being in a swimmer, getting up every morning, an early start for us is 7 a.m. in the pool but you know it's the kids that are not at that elite level yet that are getting up and have to be in the pool at 5.30. So you know I was that, I was back then and uh, now I'm at that 7 o'clock level but it's those days that you hate, uh, those days that you dislike, that you don't want to do it. Uh, I always go and think in my mind, well, if I don't do it, I know that my opposition is always going to be one step in ahead of me doing that extra training session at the end of the day. So I really create myself in a space that every day has to be a winning day. It's not really about winning at the end of the day or at the end of the challenge. It's about mm -hmm. making every day a winning day. So that's um, really the main head space that I put, set myself up in, especially leading into obviously Rio. Right. And also, we were talking earlier about being part of a team, as, as many of you will be, whether your team are staff on farm, whether it's your accountant, your consultant, your family, whoever. Um, and just having that dedication and commitment to your team as well um, yeah. would, would be something that you're all working in a similar way, aren't you? Yeah, I have a, a very close team oh, that's made up of a biomechanist, um, a psychologist, um, physio, and gym trainer. So. Having a very close knit team, and obviously my coach, uh, Rolly, but having that close team has been hugely beneficial. I don't see myself as an individual. Obviously, I'm an individual sport, but if I was an individual, I'd be going to the pool by myself. I'd be going to the gym by myself. I'd be creating all these um, programs up for myself to do by myself, and I can't do that as an athlete. You need to have the people that are supporting you. Uh, they're just as much a part of that medal as what I am at the end of the day. So they're hugely important. I mean, we catch up every month, uh, all of us as a team. Uh, that's where I'm off to after this. Uh, but it's, as an athlete, you see the benefits of having that support around you. There are people that you trust. Uh, you gain a huge trust. But you gain their trust <coughs> as being confident in what you do as an athlete. And, all that, and for them to have the dedication uh, as well for what they do and passionate about what they do. And I can see that with my team. I mean, I've had to, uh, before Beijing, I had to cut someone out of my team because they weren't good enough. They weren't at the standard that I wanted them at. So it's, it's you, you got to give back as well. It's yeah. give and take. Yeah. Well, as I'm sure many people here will, you know, ditch their accountant or whoever if they're not good enough. <laughs> they don't make the figures work. Um, so yes, it's, it's all about teamwork. And now I know why I have to get up at 5.30 in the morning to go running at 6. It's because I'm not elite. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm often running against David Gardner in, uh, in races in Wanaka. And um, we like to think that we get on the podium sometimes, but we're always in the old, old people's classes, aren't we, David? But that's why, because I'm that's why I'm running at six in the morning. Thank you for re reassuring me of that. Um, well, we, um, we are heading towards lunchtime. Um, and, you know, I've asked a few questions, but I'm sure you would have others that you want to ask either of, of Sophie or me. So maybe if we um, hand it back over to, to Bill and if you have any questions, please fire away. Because Sophie won't be able to stay. She's been in the gym this morning. What's for lunch, though? Well, <laughs> <laughs> I'm... I'm I'm really hoping you don't have to ask that because I'm assuming <laughs> that we'll only be eating beef and lamb. Yeah. So maybe stay for a bite to eat. But so thanks, Fiona and Sophie. Uh, right, there's an opportunity to ask Sophie and Fiona questions around the, the Iron Maiden program and nutritional benefits, obviously, from your role, Fiona. So, some questions. Boom. They want their lunch. Teamwork. <laughs> In terms of nutrition, the only difference or the key difference for us with our grass 
pasture raising systems is the omega 3s. That's the key difference. Um, so, offshore, that's the key thing that we can promote compared to other meats is the fact that our uh, meat that comes from animals raised on pasture is higher in omega 3s. But uh, generally speaking, in terms of other beef and lamb across the world, the rest will stay fairly similar. And what about the um, rice and chicken and pork? We don't mention Did you that. say the word? <laughs> <laughs> I twitch when I hear that word. Um, uh, again, iron is a key one. Uh, so the iron and zinc levels will be higher in beef and lamb. Um, Fat content is of lean beef and lamb. I know a lot of you sitting there will be going, oh, but we like the fat on meat. <laughs> Sorry, but consumers don't, and it's not, you know, it's not a positive message. Um, but actually, fat-wise, we line up pretty well as well. Um, so because actually that, that C word, protein, uh, that f their fat content has increased over time, if anything. Um, and it all depends how you eat it, you know, whether you take the skin off, the fat off, all that sort of thing. So actually, from a fat point of view, we have a pretty positive story, whereas most people would think we wouldn't. So that's something that we are always trying to portray. Mm. Yeah, question. Yeah, how big an impact is the animal welfare thing against it? Please don't mention it, because <laughs> wolves have ears. Um, oh, touch wood. Not too bad at the moment, um, but you just can't sit on your laurels. Um, and I know when pork had the issue a few years ago, uh, some people said to me, oh, you must be pleased, it's pork. And I said, well, no, I'm not pleased because any focus on any animal can focuses on animal welfare per se. So um, yeah, we, we don't want any animal to be suffering, obviously, and we don't want any industry to be facing what they faced. So we have to make sure our contracts are fairly uh, strict on that sort of thing. And I, and I know when that happened with uh, Mike King, we went back and looked at our contracts quite carefully with the girls that we had at the time. Um, because boy, oh boy, you wouldn't want any of any of our girls to do that. Um, so yeah, it's not a biggie for us at the moment, but we do, it's a watching brief, certainly. Uh, no, not overseas, no, obviously more nationwide here with the New Zealand. Um. Yeah, that, that's a great question actually. Thank you for asking that because um, yeah, this campaign would not work overseas. Um, at, at this stage, um, other than in their own sports, these girls won't be known overseas. Uh, so yeah, Beef and Lamb New Zealand Limited, the, the Wellington team, um, will do their own campaign simply because they have to make it appropriate for their own target market. So they have used the All Blacks, actually. I, I know in France one time they did something with the All Blacks. Um, now, for all the reasons I've said to you, we, we wouldn't use the All Blacks. Um, they also demand telephone numbers in terms of fees, I think. Uh, but, you know, to people overseas, New Zealand is the All Blacks. So that was appropriate in, in Europe. But, yeah. We, we've got the Iron Maidens for New Zealand and that's where it works. Uh, Sophie, how's the training going for, I presume your target's Rio? Uh, yeah, well we have stepping stones in between, so yeah. this year we have world champs in August, so I'm just training up for that at the moment. Yeah. Oh, so just, just. Just. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, if there's any other questions, uh, look, it's been a real privilege to have both Fiona and Sophie here, and, uh, and Sophie in particular, well, the three Iron Maidens, the young Iron Maidens, all the best of luck for the next targets, which is World Champs and mm. hopefully Golds and World Champs and at Rio. Thank you. We're, we're really, you know, we're, as a nation, it's incredible how um, how we all get behind uh, these high achievers and having these girls and Sophie winning all your Golds and, Lisa's going pretty well overseas now, mm. so at the moment she's vlogging them all. So it's look, it's a real buzz, and I'm just so pleased that we've had you here today. Thank you. And that you're a local girl as well. Yep. So um, thank you very much, and we've adopted Fiona as one of ours too. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, girl. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Pleasure.